wondering if Miss Maggie might have a song this evening. She does. Let's give her a hand as she comes forward. Boys, you got one next? Okay. Oh, my goodness. The Dismissed your classes, that'll be all, gentlemen. Thank you. Anybody in here ever been told to listen? Amen. Hey, just listen. Anybody ever been told like that? How about this one? You're not listening. How about listen to me. Just listen. Just just listen. Anybody? Yeah, okay. All right. Turn with me if you will to first Samuel. First Samuel chapter two. And we'll start with verse twenty two. I don't know how far we're gonna go in this tonight, but we're just going to follow the leading of the Lord. It is not easy to minister a lot of times. So I require your prayers. Amen. I know that God will bless. Do you have 1 Samuel 2 and Verse number 22. Everybody have that? All right. Would you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes. Heavenly Father, Lord, anoint my lips of clay and let me speak as an oracle of God. Lord, let me minister only the things you would have me minister. Let me speak only the things you would have me speak. Lord, this is a sacred desk. And I stand behind it, not because I called myself, but because you called me and you've given your word. So let me be an instrument of righteousness tonight. And let me give your word to your people so that we all may grow in you. In Jesus name we pray. And the church said, Amen. There's a story of an old man and an old lady. They woke up one morning and the old lady said, I don't feel like cooking this morning. And he said, well, aren't you hungry? She said, yes. And I want you to go to the restaurant. And he said, well, okay, what do you want? She said, well, you might need to get a pen and paper. He said, no, I'll remember it. He said, she said, okay, I want two eggs scrambled. I want toast light. I want bacon, crisp, and I want hash browns, not well done. Are you sure you don't need a pen and a paper? She said, or he said, no, I don't need that. I can remember that. That's no problem. He headed out the door. About an hour and a half later, he came back. 
And the bag he held in his hand said McDonald. He plopped it down in front of her. He said, there you go. There's a Big Mac. She said, I knew you'd get this wrong. I see lettuce on it. I said, no lettuce. We have a, we have a problem listening a lot of times, don't we? <laughs> and sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it's our fault and sometimes it's not. Sometimes we just haven't been trained how to listen. Amen. I learn new things about myself every day. How about you? Uh, good things sometimes, bad things sometimes, but you know what? Still learning. Amen. And the time that we stop learning is a, <laughs> amen, <laughs> you'd be dead, is a bad time, is a bad time. If we choose to stop learning, well, that's not a good thing either. Now, we get to 1 Samuel 2 and 22, and it says this. Now, Eli was very old. Eli was the high priest at this time in the, in the Aaronic uh, priesthood. He was a descendant of Aaron. And he was the priest. He was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all of Israel. Now let me stop there. If you've got sons or daughters and you have control over them and you hear something they're doing and it's wrong, what you going to do? It is for us to do something about it. We see a wrong, we need to make it right. Amen? A lot of people don't agree with America doing this and doing that and doing the other all over the world. Let me tell you something. If we have the power to do it, I believe we should do it. I believe it is our responsibility not just to close the borders and say we're just going to take care of ours, but to take care of the things that we can take care of. Now, and how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, let me tell you what happened here. Um... Upon the brazen altar, when they were building the tabernacle, this is out in the wilderness, when they were, they were getting the instructions how to build the tabernacle, these women would bring, uh, they would bring uh, their jewelry and this and the other, but there was a certain uh, few women that brought uh, brass. And they brought brass that was finely shined so that they could see the reflection. It was a little mirror. That's what it was. But they brought that to be in dedication to God's house. And so when they had that to the priest, the priest uh, uh, kept it as shiny as it was, but made a big sort of mirror at it, and they put, they put the altar on top of it, okay? So that when the priest would go and they would offer on the altar, they would remember, hey, look, it's being done for me. It's being done to God, but for me, okay? The sacrifice. Now watch this. After other women saw these women doing that, maybe even their daughters or their great-granddaughters at this time, they would still come to the door of the tabernacle and they would minister. And if the priest needed something, if the priest, uh, if the priest or the or the Aaronic line or uh, or the Levitical line, if they needed anything in the temple, that's what these women were dedicated to. They dedicated themselves to God and to God alone. And so God was their husband. They were married to the church, pretty much, and. They were dedicated their, their whole life. They, they didn't think about, well, I want kids one day, and I, 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 want, I want a husband one day, and I want this and I want that. They just said, listen, uh, my ancestors did this. I'm going to do this. It's very honorable, honorable and very noble. I'm dedicating myself to God. Now, here's what would happen. There were two sons of Eli the priest, and they were in the Aaronic priesthood too. One day, one of them would have grown up to be the high priest right after their father Eli. If God would have allowed it to happen, which thank God he didn't. They would go because these guys were so uh, uh, maladjusted in the head. You see, they thought that because they worked in the temple. They thought because they were descendants of Aaron. They thought because the Ark of the Covenant was in the Holy of Holies that they could do no wrong. They thought that just because they had a symbol of Christianity... Oh, listen to me. This kind of sounds like today, doesn't it? Oh, we can do what we want to because, well, we go to church. We can do what we want to because I've read the Bible. I can do what I want to because, well, it's convenient today, but you know what? I've gone to church. My family's in church. I'm good to go. That's not what the Word says. The Word described exactly their duties, but they didn't want to listen to that because those duties took sacrifice. And they didn't want to sacrifice anything. 
So because they thought that way, that everything was theirs, they could do what they wanted to, that they were pretty much untouchable, here's what they would do. <clears throat> they would grab these women and forcibly either pimp them out, prostitute them out, also lay with them themselves, pretty much rape them. This is what was going on in the doorway of the temple. Uh, this is how bad it got. And now understand this. When we think that because of the absence of God, all things won't get too bad. Things aren't going to get too bad. Let me tell you something. Because of the absence of God in America, America is getting worse and worse. You ever notice that in these Islamic countries, how much fighting goes on constantly? Because there is almost a total absence of God. It is only the power of the Holy Spirit that holds Satan back as much as he does now. But without God's power, he's allowed to reign and rule. And that's why you have so much conflict and so much fighting constantly, constantly, constantly. That's why America has been spared so much. And then people think, well, what about Israel? What about Israel? Most of Israel does not believe in Jesus Christ. They don't believe that he was the only begotten of the, son, of, the of the Father. They don't believe that. So they deny his power. They have a war of godliness. Just like Eli. Just like Hophni. Just like Phineas. They had a form of godliness, but they denied the power thereof. Because with the power, oh, hallelujah. Because with the power, because with the anointing comes the power. And with the power, people want to come to church. People want to do the things of the Lord. Amen? Alright, so here's what's going on. This is Eli. Now, Eli had the right, he had the responsibility to take care of his sons and the Aaronic priesthood. He's hearing these reports. And he said unto them, he's talking to Hophni and Phineas, come here, boys, I'm going to talk to you. He didn't take them out of their priestship roles. He didn't discipline them. He just thought, well, I'll just talk to them. Let me tell you something. I know there are proponents and opponents of corporal punishment. I understand that. But I work on the front lines of schools. Okay, I see these kids every day. And I can tell you, beyond a shadow of a doubt, which kid is disciplined at home and which kid is not. Which kid gets talked to and which kid actually knows that there's going to be some pain involved with that decision. Not, not, not leaving bruises or welts or hurting that child indefinitely. I'm talking about a reminder that with this action comes a warm hind end. Now, and he said unto them, why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. In other words, listen, I'm getting reports every day about how evil you two are. Nay, my sons, listen, no, my sons, no, 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 now don't do that. Bad boys. Well, that's really going to mean a lot to them, isn't it? You got two grown men. You say, no, boys, come on now. Now, a lot of parents are deluded these days. They think that because they love their children, they let their children buy with anything. Well, I love them too much to say no. God says, love them enough to say no. Amen. Love them enough to discipline them. Love them enough to set the example. Love them enough to show them, hey, listen, not in my house, not under my roof. Now, here we go. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people to transgress. In other words, hey, you're leading people wrong. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father. Because the Lord would slay them. And the child Samuel grew on. And it was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. And there came a man of God unto Eli. Now listen. We have just been introduced that Hannah dedicated Eli, her son. Her first and only son. She said, God, if you'll let me have him, I'll dedicate him to your service. I don't know how she did it. As a parent, I have no idea how she did it. Except that she, her bond with God was stronger than her bond with her kids. Okay, now listen. What an example that she showed Eli. She said, my, my, my bond with God means more to me. My word, 
my promise to God means more to me than, than my, my child living in my house. Eli was just the opposite. Eli was, well, my children mean more to me than my promise to God. Now watch. Hophni, Phineas, they see this new kid come into the temple, dedicated to God's worship. Okay? He's growing up. But while he's growing up, while he's still just a toddler, while he's growing up, listen to this. God sends a man. The Bible doesn't even say his name. But the Bible does record his message. He goes to Eli, and he's given Eli, God has given Eli a chance to make it right. Watch what he says. And there came a man of God unto Eli, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of your father? And when they were in Egypt, in Pharaoh's house, did I choose him, talking about Aaron, out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of your father all the offerings made of fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore, kick ye at my sacrifice and at my offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest your sons above me. Do you see how God sees it? When we don't keep our word to God, do you see how God sees it when we tell God, yes, God, I love you, but I'm going to do my own thing. And yes, God, I know to be in your house, and I know to read your word, and I know to praise you. I know all this stuff. Thank you, Lord. I've got that in my heart. But I don't feel like it today. I'm going to do this. God is saying you're kicking at my sacrifice. You're, you're literally, spiritually, you're kicking at my sacrifice. You're making fun of, of how important God is about the sacrifice that he made over and again. He said, you're just sitting there, you're kicking at it. I'm giving you life. I'm letting you breathe. I'm letting you live this life. I've got a home prepared for you in glory if you'll just hearken to my word. Listen up. Listen up. That's what he's saying. He's saying, listen, quit kicking at my sacrifice. Hey, I'm, I'm preaching to me tonight too, church. Come on now. He's always saying that. God is constantly telling the Israelites to listen. Listen. I've got great things in store for you. He tells them that in Deuteronomy 6, 3, in Isaiah 55 and 3. God is saying, let me lead you. Let me guide you. Let me bless you. All you've got to do is listen to my word. Watch this. And honors your sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Here's what was going on. The Bible says that since the, uh, the Levites and the priests, they didn't work, okay? Their job was to serve the Lord in the temple. That was their whole job. Make sure the temple was running as God said to make it run. So what would happen is, when people would bring sacrifice in, God said, for the priests and the Levites, here's what you're going to do. You're going to take this three-clawed hook. And as they're boiling it, because that's the only way you're going to eat it. The only way the priests are going to eat is if it's boiled. Okay? And as you're boiling it, you're going to take this three-pronged hook, and you're going to reach it down, you're going to pull out, and what you pull out is yours. And they said, listen, also, you can have the right shoulder and the right breast. That, that's it. That's all you get. And the rest is for the people. Here's what they were doing. They were going in, and they were saying, no, 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 I don't want it boiled. I want it like this. You give me this even before you boil it. I want my portion, and I want your portion. So people, when they would come to God's house, they were saying, oh, I dread it. They weren't thinking of it as a praise and worship thing. How many times do we think about like that when we give in our offerings and our tithes? When we give up our time and our talents to God. How many times do we say, oh, I really don't have this. I really don't feel like that. I don't feel like I don't feel like standing up. I don't feel like singing. How many times do we look at it as a chore instead of a, 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 a your body as an instrument of worship to the Lord, right? Because that's how it's, it's a sacrifice of rest. See, when they would come in, they would dread it so much that God was saying, "Listen, they're giving me some offering, but I'm not getting any glory out of this because they're not doing it with the right heart because their mind is on the priest." Instead of God, that the priest was supposed to be serving. And they were causing Israel to sin and transgress. Does that sound like modern churches? Modern churches pray for revival. Oh God, 
I, there's, there's, there's a church on my bus route that, that at least once every two months are having a revival. That must be a sad, sad church. If you've got to revive it every other month, there's a situation there. If you've got to constantly revive it, revive it. Are you kidding me? Who needs that? you got churches, though, that are praying for revival constantly. Why? Because they don't understand that all they see about revival is growth. Uh, uh, new preachers, uh, somebody coming in, uh, uh, more people in the church. They don't realize that, yeah, God brings life. Revival brings life. But it also brings a death before the life. It is a death of yourself. You see, Eli didn't realize that. Hop and I finished it. And you know what? Eli, the guy that was seen to tell about it. See, Eli was a big man. Eli was a, a fat man. He did. In the next chapter, he said, in, in chapter 4, he said, for Eli was a heavy man. Now, understand this. He knew his sons were transgressing, getting that meat like that. He knew his sons were, but you know what he was doing? He was saying, boys, that's wrong. Don't do that again. Now, give me some. How in the world did he eat? How in the world did he get that? He ate. Didn't do anything. He let his boys run free, just kind of sat in the chair, just kept on eating. The same chair that he fell out of and died, by the way. Mm -hmm. Now watch this. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel said, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, be it far from me. Listen, this is what God is saying to us today. His promises are without end. But they are conditional. You see, God says right here, them who honor me will I honor, and they who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. You see, God is making a promise to everyone right here, right now. If you honor God, listen, listen, I, I, I understand some people like uh, um, um, uh, football. I understand that some people like golf, and I understand that some people like basketball. I understand that some people like racing, and I understand that some people like fishing, and I understand that some people like visiting. I get that. But God says to keep my Sabbath holy. He says, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. So when you look at it, you think of it as, well, I'm just going to go have fun today. It's okay. When you look at it and I look at it, I say, well, I'm just going to visit in a while. It's okay. When we look at it, I'm just going to play this sport. I'm just going to go put a line in the water. It's okay. I'm just going to hang out with my friend. But the way God looks at it is, hey, listen, you're not honoring me. And because you're not honoring me, I'm not going to honor you at all. That's what he said. I'm going to esteem you very light. Now, that tells me that if I honor God, it doesn't matter if you're next in line or if you're next in line. If you're, if you're not honoring God, I'm next in line. Amen. That's a promise, and that's a privilege. Behold, the days come that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house, that there shall not be an old man in your house. You shall see an enemy in my habitation, and all the wealth of God shall give Israel, and there shall not be an old man in your house forever. And the man of yours, whom I shall not cut off from my altar, shall be to consume your eyes, to grieve your heart, and all the increase of your house shall die in the flower of their age. And this shall be a sign unto you, that shall come upon your two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall die, both of them. I would think that if I was a caring parent, it didn't matter if I had to waddle myself over to those boys. I'm going to get in the way of them and, and, and doing what they were doing in the temple. Amen? Because the prophet of God just told them, look, they're going to die in the same day. I'm going to cut you off. When the Bible talks about cut off your arm, he's talking about the strength of your family. And he says, I'm going to cut your family off. Those who honor me, I'm going to honor. You, you understand what God's saying here. He's giving warning after warning. One would think if we believe God, if we were listening to God. How many know that it's easy to sit through a church service and never listen? Hey, I got news for you. I preached and not listened. That's crazy, isn't it? Preached it and not listened. And later on, Thinking about it, oh, I said that. Totally missed it. <laughs> it's crazy. 
But we get lulled into that. We get lulled into thinking about other things. You know how many things I would sit and I would stare at the preacher for, for seemed like forever, no offense. <laughs> I would stare until the room started going sideways. And I'd just sit and stare. Well, I'll just stay here and stare. I'm, I'm still looking. I would run back and forth to the bathroom. I would, I mean, I'd look at pictures, play with my watch, lift in my pocket. It didn't matter. Anything that would, could distract me. Amen? How many have been distracted by all of those things and then some, huh? Yeah, absolutely. How about the belly rumbling? Hmm? How about thinking, hmm, did I put my phone on vibrate? I don't know. I better check it. Oh, but while I'm on here, hmm? <laughs> yeah. Amen. All right. Oh, me. <laughs> so here we go. Look at verse number one of chapter three. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. There was no open vision, but Eli got a word from the Lord, didn't he? He got a warning from the Lord. Let me tell you something. The farther you get away from the Lord, the less you hear when I was doing things that I shouldn't do, and I moved from Lenore up here, I was thinking, well, I got nobody to hang around with. I guess I'll just have to make trips and, you know, do things I shouldn't do down there. But it was funny. The first day, I met the same people that were doing the same things I shouldn't do at the same place I was. It's crazy. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's cool. But it wasn't cool. You see, Satan is vying for your soul. Amen? And he'll support you any way he can not to do the right thing. All right, watch this. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. <laughs> there was no vision. The Lord's word was not heard from. Eli couldn't see. Boy, does that describe the church today or what? We got huge, the most beautiful buildings all over this country that could seat hundreds of thousands. That, listen, there's no reason why every church in hot springs in this area should be packed out tonight or, or Sundays. There, there's no reason. There's no reason. Except. That the powers of darkness have convinced people that they do not need to listen to God. However, when you go and witness to people and knock on their doors. Hey, do you go to church anywhere? Yeah, they'll name a church. But then you ask that pastor. That's one good thing about being friends with pastors. Hey, I went and knocked on that door. Sister so-and-so said that she went to church. I haven't seen her in five years. Oh. Oh. Now, understand this. It's an easy thing to do to name a church. It's an easy thing to do to say, well, my family, well, I'm always... Hey, listen, that's not what God wants. God doesn't care about our programs. He doesn't care about our padded pews. He does not care about our fans and our light fixtures. He doesn't care about our new vanities in the bathrooms. He doesn't. You know what he cares about? He cares about a relationship with every one of you and me. That's what he cares about. You want to make God smile? Let's put another coat of paint on the church. No. Nope. You want to make God smile? Well, let's clean the pews. No. Nope. You want to make God smile? Let's put some shelving up in that kitchen. No. Nope. Make your preacher smile. And make God smile. Start letting him occupy every room in your heart. Amen. Start letting him occupy every thought in your mind. I need to do that too. Amen. All right. So how did Samuel. Oh, I'm about to get ahead of myself. And there and ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord. What a sad thing. Where the ark of God was. And Samuel was laid down to sleep. Now, see, it said it all in that one verse. So Samuel slept near the ark of God. Now, oh, this is, this is beautiful. The, the, the candlestick was before, was in front of the veil that went in front of the Holy of Holies. Okay? So it was their job to keep it lit. It was their job. But while they were supposed to keep it lit, the one that was supposed to be in charge of making sure everything was right was sleeping. 
And his eyes were waxed dim. He wasn't hearing God's voice anymore. He had at one time. I do believe that. But he wasn't hearing God's voice anymore. And so the lamp of God. Oh, listen, church. The only way that we're going to have the power of God in our services is if the lamp of God does not go out. Because the lamp of God today is the word of God. And the word of God is lived through our actions, through our lives. The word of God needs to be preached and taught in everything we do and say. You see, this is God's will for his church. That we be a light. Amen. A light and salt. A light on a hill that cannot be hid. You see, that's what it's about. But we have too many people like Sister Tina was talking about. Too many ministers, too many churches that are going to this one world religion. Chrislam, that's what it's called. They're going to this one world religion where, oh, we and the Muslims can get along. It's the same God. No, no, let me tell you something. My God says, love them that curse you. My God says, love them. Love them into repentance. Amen? Allah does not say that. If you don't believe me, there's a Quran back there in my study in English, which makes it invalid. But you can read it, and it says that if they do not believe, they are infidels, and infidels should be killed. It's true. So don't ever let somebody tell you that it's the same God. It's not the same God. There is one God. His name is Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Give him praise, church. Amen. <laughs> now watch this. The lamp of God went out <laughs> where the ark of God was. And Samuel was laid down to sleep that the Lord called Samuel. And he answered, here am I. And he ran to Eli and said, here am I, for you called me. So imagine you're Samuel. The light went out. It's kind of dark, pretty dark. And you hear your name called Samuel. Must be Eli. We're the only two in here. <laughs> Goes over to Eli's room. Yes, Eli. You called. You rang. And he said, I called not. Lie down again. He's like, you're crazy, little boy. Go lay down. He's probably 14 or 15 at this time. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again. Samuel. And Samuel arose. And went to Eli. And said, here am I. For you did call me. Notice he said, you called me the first time. This time he said, for you did call me. Okay. Look, you're old. Maybe you can't remember. I don't know. But you did call me. And he answered, I called not. My son, lie down again. In other words, he said, boy, go to bed. Could bother me. I'm old and need to sleep. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. You see, it's one thing to know the things of the Lord. But it's a different thing to know the Lord altogether. Amen. And let me tell you something tonight. No matter what is important in your life. No matter what thing, what place, or who is important in your life. You may think you can't live without it. You may think you can't live without them. You may think you can't live without that place or go into that place. But let me tell you this. With God, all other things fade. Everything else fades by comparison when you think about the love of God. Because God doesn't just say, I love you. God doesn't just say, I will love you forever. God showed us he loved us. When he gave his only begotten son and he died on the cross of Calvary. Hallelujah. <laughs> you, you see, it's not just empty promises. It's a promise fulfilled. Hallelujah. Listen to this. So Eli's getting frustrated and Samuel's thinking he's hearing things. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. Oh my. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I. For you did call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Hallelujah. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down and it shall be if he call you that you shall say, speak, Lord, for thy servant hears. And watch this. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now, I, I, I want to paint this picture for you. When I thought about this story all this time, all these years, hearing it preached and everything like that, I've always imagined God's voice calling Samuel. Samuel. 
Samuel gets up and goes, Eli, yes, Eli. Go lie down. Samuel, yes, Eli, you did call me. Go lie down. But it wasn't just his voice. God didn't just send his voice. <laughs> when, when Israel needs something, when they need a God that they can trust, and they need a God that they can rely on, God's not just going to send his voice. Amen. When you need somebody that you can rely on, God's not just going to send his voice. God himself comes down. <laughs> now, understand this. When he's calling Samuel, God is there in the same room. You see, the Bible says that he dwells in a thick darkness. It doesn't matter if he was on the surface of the sun because God is so bright and God is so powerful that no matter where he is, everything else looks dark around him. Amen. Amen. <laughs> But God chooses sometimes not to reveal himself yet. Could it be that he was given Eli another chance? Eli knew that God was speaking. He perceived it. He could have wondered, why not me? Oh God, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my transgressions. But he didn't do that. He just said, go tell him you're here if he calls again. Still hardening his heart. So God chooses to reveal himself. Now, here's what I'm telling you. I believe God was standing there right there. And here's why. Look at the next verse. And the Lord came and stood. Now see, a lot of people think, oh, that last time he came and stood. No, 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 watch, watch, watch. Came and stood and called as at other times. He did the same thing three times before. He came down and he called. And he was there to minister. Now, wherever you are right now, spiritually speaking, physically, mentally, emotionally, God is here. God is not sitting in heaven somewhere. But God has come down. And I need him. He didn't just say, look, I sent my word a few years ago. He said, I sent my word to remind you that I am a living God. And that all your problems I can solve. All your situations, I already have the answer to. Sometimes it's hard to fall in love with a God you haven't seen. Hmm? That's why it's so difficult for us to walk with him a lot of times. Because we can't just reach out and touch him. We can't just go around the corner and see him. But he's here. And you can feel him. You can feel him in the room right now. I don't know what that does for you. There's some, I, I don't know. I have no idea what's going on. But let me tell you why Samuel heard God's voice. Samuel heard God's voice because he dwelt in the temple. He was around God's people constantly. Listen, churchgoers. He was there when the doors were opened. I know what you're going to say. He lived there. That's a good testimony. <laughs> he went to church functions he constantly surrounded himself with godly people, with godly things. There, there's an entire movement now that thinks that, and, and listen, in Greenville there are two Christian bands and two uh, good Christian bands. They're really good, and they've turned Christian country now. Let me tell you something, and I'm not just preaching on music. And I have a hard time with that myself because I love music. I love it. I love different genres, different types. Just, just the way that you do flows together. But you got to listen to the message. Oh, well, this song's not too bad. Yeah, but what does it lead to? Listen to the next song. Oh, and this is the same artist that sang that song, so this one might be good enough. There's a constant lowering of standards, even with friends. Let me tell you something. If your friend's a drug dealer, don't expect your children, if they're around that friend, not to grow up and think that that's okay. But I tell them it's not. Yeah, but who do you expose them to? 
We have good parents in this church. We do. We have really good parents in this church. But I'm telling you, Satan is out. And he's out to take your children. And he's out to take your life. And God has come down. And he wants to heal. Samuel heard God because he constantly pleaded God. Not only this, but the Bible says in Samuel 2 and 21, and the child grew before the Lord. He was constantly growing. He wasn't just around godly things, but he was growing. And before you look at somebody else or your thoughts start to wonder about whatever, when's the last time you grew? And I'm not saying that to be facetious or anything like that, but I had to ask myself the same question. I'm going to close with this. I read this and I read it three times in this passage and there's a reason for it. There's a phrase. It says this in 1 Samuel 2.11, 2.18 and 3 and 1. Samuel ministered before the Lord. It means if you're really listening to God, what you hear from him will cause you to minister for him. Plain and simple. With every head bowed and every eye closed.